What would you say if I challenged your understanding of Marxism and in the process threatened sacredly held libertarian values? What would you say to me? you. A lot of people say that Marx is anti-individual. He's not individualist because he thinks about things in terms of classes and class conflict. That is a very superficial reading of, of Marx. Actually, Marx is an individualist because if you look at how he defines classes, he defines them by reference to the way in which individuals relate to the means of production. I've noticed when people talk about Marx, most of them take a very shallow interpretation of Marx's philosophy. They talk about capitalism, socialism, and communism as if they were three football teams competing in some economic Super Bowl for social dominance. This isn't what Marx had in mind at all. For Marx, these three social and economic systems were distinct stages in the economic evolution of mankind. Marx was a contemporary of Darwin and imagined economies evolving over time, changing to accommodate various social and technological pressures. Like lower primates led to mankind, capitalism would eventually lead to socialism and socialism would lead to communism. Many people want to shoot down Marx's philosophy on the grounds that it goes against human nature. But Marx himself had a pretty fair understanding of how human nature works. He knew societies often become unstable, that many people long for something more than mindless work, and that oppression and unfairness can breed dissent and sometimes violent revolution. Most people debating Marxist theory today focus on human nature, but they forget the most radical part of Marx's ideas was the concept of superabundance. Marx believed capitalism had the power to produce radical surpluses, more than enough to fulfill every human need or desire. This capitalist system had the power to lead us to utopia. Though the system itself held certain intrinsic flaws that would eventually lead to crisis and the birth of the intermediate system he called socialism. One of these flaws was money. Once you build a system based solely on currency as a means of exchange, liquidity crises have the power to bring the whole structure down. We've seen this all too recently. Technology also presents issues for society. Automation leads to both higher startup costs for new businesses and a reduced demand for human labor. More capital-intensive businesses can create monopoly industries, killing competition, eliminating the need in some industries to innovate at all. As automation increases, unemployment can lead to weak demand for the goods and services capitalism produces. This increases the ever-present stratification of society, leading to angry and militant populations eager to take the automated reins of production for themselves and the good of the wider society at large. Libertarians spend countless hours debating human nature as it relates to Marx, but I rarely hear them engage the topic of superabundance. Marx understood human nature quite well for a man living in the 1800s, but his point was human nature is destined to evolve as our economic environment evolves around us. Superabundance has always been the weakest link in Marx's argument, but I often wonder if it always will be. Futurists like Ray Kurzweil or Aubrey de Grey believe there are humans alive today that will become immortal, and we will soon have the ability to create virtual worlds where people can be whatever they want to be. What will money mean in a place like this? How will humanity value things in a virtual world where pink Lamborghinis and perfect bodies have essentially zero cost to produce? How will populations react once the difference between wealthy elites and the wider society is not just one of financial means, but also incorporates huge discrepancies in life expectancy as well. How will the governing class respond once superfluous masses pose any superficial threat to an ever-increasing grip on eternal youth or their technological ability to sustain unending immortality? If Marx was alive today, I think these are the questions he'd be wrestling with. Not some trivial debate over brain drain or CEO compensation. I agree with most libertarian principles, but the world the world is not a static place. It's changing before our very eyes, changing in ways Marx may have never imagined. Maybe it's time to stop subscribing to economic dogma of the past and start debating the realities of humanity's economic future. How is this going to work, Carl? This is nothing more than a utopian idealist dream, like all Marxist philosophy is, which inevitably leads to communism. Utopia. 
we're never gonna reach it. This is the best system we have for very good reasons. It's a global trance. These are the sorts of unbelievable excuses that people give for aging. And I mean, okay, I'm not actually saying that these excuses are completely valueless. There are some good points to be made here, things that we ought to be thinking about, forward planning, so that nothing goes too well, so that we minimize the turbulence when we actually figure out how to fix aging. But these are completely crazy when you actually you know, remember your sense of proportion. Now, there is one argument that some people do think really is that strong, and here it is. People worry about overpopulation. They say, well, if we fix aging, no one's going to die to speak of, or at least the de death toll is going to be much lower, only from crossing St. Giles carelessly, and therefore we're not going to be able to have many kids, and kids are really important to most people. I think it's true that we will face a dilemma in this respect. We will have to decide whether to have a low birth rate or a high death rate. And I say that that's fine. The future of humanity is entitled to make that choice. What's not fine is for us to make that choice on behalf of the future. If we vacillate and hesitate and do not actually develop these therapies, then we are condemning a whole cohort of people who would have been young enough and healthy enough to benefit from those therapies, but will not be because we haven't developed them as quickly as we could. We will be denying those people an indefinite lifespan, and I consider that that is immoral. 40, call it 40, 40 years ago, we had Pong, like two rectangles and a dot. That right. was what games were. Now, 40 years later, we have photorealistic 3D simulations with millions of people playing simultaneously, and it's getting better every year. And soon we'll have virtual reality, we'll have augmented reality. Um, if you assume any rate of improvement at all, um, then the games will become indistinguishable from reality. Just in, indistinguishable. E either we're going to create simulations that are indistinguishable from reality, or civilization will cease to exist. Those are the two options. Are killing me here. Honestly, why aren't you subscribing to my channel? Do you want me to wash your car? Do I have to take your sister out to lunch? Come on, subscribe already. Don't be shy. I can go after feminists. I I'm cool. I know all the big words like like MGTOW, social justice. Subscribe, please. I hate all the exact same people as you. Steve Shives, Christy Winters, that dumbass demotivator guy. Demotivator sucks! You could validate my entire existence. Subscribe. Come back. It'll be fun.